three things that we discussed is um, book, ha basically have find an agent, so just best practices and things like that, as well as um, how to write a book proposal. Uh, so I'll, I'll ramble incessantly about that. That's one of my favorite topics. Um, query letters, and then my fun class is the marketing portion. So that's our, we'll, we'll round it out on marketing. So if you like have your laptop or your, your iPad or whatever, you're free to, it's fun to participate a little bit. So we'll, we'll kind of cover all the bases, how to find us and what to do after your book is published. So, um, so there you go. I like visuals. So 10 o'clock, finding, pitching your idea. And the reason I like to talk about this with people is a lot of times people have a great idea, but they, they, they kind of almost do a disservice to their book because they haven't actually pitched it the best it can be. So uh, I've been around, I'm, by the way, just a little bit about me. I'm the owner of Red Sofa Literary, so I've been an agent since 2002. I've owned Red Sofa since the end of 2008. So I have uh, seven people at my agency counting myself. Um, and there's four of us in the Twin Cities, one in Utah, one in Virginia, and one in the UK. So we're all over the place. Um, and uh, we, as for myself, I, I am the one who created Red Sofa. And yes, I do have one, so everyone always asks. Um, and I do have a cat, so if you see the logo, yes, I have two of them, actually. Um, but I find that uh, in the early days of agenting, I didn't actually, I was much more patient and I could help look at any idea, even if the pitch was bad, as writing is a very isolated task, but marketing is, you have to start way before your book comes out, marketing yourself, not just your book. So do the first thing, pitching your query and finding your match. Um, I don't know if you ever saw Little Miss Sunshine, but everyone somehow glamorized the literary agent world. This is really our life. Um, we basically work all the time. Um, we don't get paid unless we sell your book. So that is, that is the reality of our world. Um, so I don't get paid by you. So if you ever approach an agent and they're wanting money from you up front, you need to run as fast as you possibly can. Don't do it. Things worth noting. Um, before you approach an agent, some numbers worth noting. We receive anywhere from 100 to 150 queries a week. Um, if you are a new agent, uh, even more. So. You know your lives and you know how, how well you handle email. Do you ever feel buried if you have more than 50 emails in your inbox? I mean, that's how we feel all the time. Um, Laura, for example, at the agency was profiled on Writer's Digest a few years ago. And within one day, she got 1,000 queries. And by the end of the year, she had 10,000 queries she had to answer, over 10,000. Um, and as a result, you would think she signed a lot of people, but no, she was still answering those queries six months after receipt of 10,000 queries. So it takes a while. By the time we get your book sold, then the book contract will say when it's coming out. So right now, everything I've sold is coming out late 2017 right now and early 2018. That's where I'm at right now. And we're only in... We're in May of, you know, almost. So it's about a year and a half. Some of the smaller publishers might be able to do it in six to ten months or six to twelve, but if you're going with some of the bigger houses, it's a year and a half, two years out. So I'm going to ask you a lot of things. Do you know your book's category? Um, if you don't know where your book needs to be shelved, we are already at a point where you've got to get some homework done. Um, a lot of people will use a statement, blanket statement, ages 9 to 99 will read my book. That is a great idea, but actually the bookstore doesn't have a 9 to 99 section. They actually have sections. So I need you to choose a section where you think your book will be. That means you got to know if it's fiction or nonfiction. So when you do your pitch, it needs to be fiction or nonfiction. You got to mention that. And then you need to know where in those sections. Is it, you know, mystery, like mystery thriller, you know, and you don't even have to say it's for adults, but if it's for children, you would need to say that. Um, and if I read your pitch or you, your query letter and I don't even know what category it is, we already are also, also on some rough footing. Before you also pitch your idea, you need to have your book done if it's fiction. And that means it's been through a few edits, a few drafts. It's, been, it's gotten exercised a little bit. Um, the best way to not get a request from an agent is to say you just finished your book. If you just finished your book, that says to me your book is not ready. My author, Patrick, we sold, uh, he worked on the book for five years. He, did, he, was a, he was, got to be in the mentorship program at The Loft, and it was draft number five I read, but I didn't see it again until draft number 11. 
and that was after a few years. And we sold draft number 12 to Gray Wolf, and then draft number 13 was the final draft that comes out next year. Um, also, a competitive analysis. Uh, every book in the world is competition, that's the reality, but you need to actually do competitive analysis of the books in your books category. Um, there's a guy who used to be an agent and he was an editor and a publisher and he, his name's Mike Napa, and he said that um, the best way to figure out how your book, if your book is working or not, is once you know your book's category, go to a bookstore, go to the section where your book would be shelved, and pull off like a handful of books from that section and see what they did that worked. Read the first five pages. Look at the layout. Look at all those little elements of the book because that'll kind of give you an idea of why those books got published and why they're sitting on that shelf today. Um, especially with fiction, it helps you see what, what was good openings, like if it's mystery specifically or a thriller or some specific genre. Um, for young adult, that's a, you know, it's now broken down into categories, thankfully, so you can, if you're a specific category in young adult, that you can, you can narrow it down like you need to. Um, and then the word count is another area that will be a flag. Um, do, you, do you guys know word counts very well? Does have, has everyone gotten pretty well acquainted with that? Uh, I'll kind of give you the skinny, it varies a little bit, but for lower middle grade, and that's for children like ages 7 to 11, 7 to 12 approximately, this is about 20,000 words. But if you're going to do higher middle grade or upper middle grade, um, that could be from 8 to 13 approximately. That can be 40 to 45,000 words. But then when we get into young adult, young adult, depending on the, cat, you know, the genre in that or the category in young adult, like is it, is it a thriller or is it paranormal, is it romance, whatever, contemporary, anywhere from 65K to 80K is, a, is about average. Uh, and then when we get into what I call the big kid books, <laughs> anything is not for children. Um, so obviously for mysteries and thrillers, um, you know, any, it's 70 to 80,000 words is, is okay. And, I, and, and for my nonfiction titles, I've sold it's anywhere from 80 to 100,000 words. Um, and then for science fiction and fantasy, that is the one area where you can go kind of crazy with the word count. So I've seen it go as high as 100,000. Uh, obviously, with world building, that's, that's why those science fiction novels are just thick. They're door stoppers. Uh, so, but I do encourage people not to go over 100K if you can. Um, generally, if I see anything over 100,000 words, I hesitate yet again because that's just that's a lot of words. Um, and then, of course, I talked about the editing. Is your book in the best shape it can be? And then also, you need to be able to describe your book to me in 50 words or less. This is an exercise of patience. So specifically, the things we look for are, is your book commercially viable? That means, can I sell it to a publisher? Will they want to spend a lot of money on you? And, and that means putting money into production, editing, marketing, all those things. So it, it gets pretty expensive to make a book. Um, so anyone who's ever self-published has learned that hands-on. Also, can, what is your voice? Like, I want to get an idea of what you write. So you're, when you pitch your idea or you write your query letter, I should get the essence of what your writing voice is like. Are you a good writer? Um, that includes uh, grammar. So if I see a lot of bad grammar and things like that, that starts to make me worry. Because if I represent you and I feel I have to edit your manuscript for just grammatical stuff, that's, gonna, or that's just going to be that's a little bit worrisome. Um, and also, you, we want to know your category. Like, I keep, if, cannot emphasize that. And for um, nonfiction, um, you need a platform, which we'll talk, that's more about the last part of today. But platform is, do you bring an audience to the table already? Um, if you're writing nonfiction, you actually need to kind of be known as someone who has built a, a readership talking about whatever it is you, you know about that's more, you know, about real life, more so. And then professionalism. You'd be surprised how many people have, uh, have really lost the ability to be professional. <laughs> so I always tell people, think about your job. If you're looking for a job, you would be professional. And when you're looking for an agent, you would bring the same level of professionalism to the table. Um, also, there's the untapped readership that you haven't reached yet. Maybe readers you don't have yet, but people who might like it. So for example, there is a, a writer who gave me an amazing book proposal, and it's about his Beatles tribute band that traveled throughout the Viet Cong and did 
concerts, Beatles concerts, like saying Beatles songs to the troops. So to me, he hasn't reached his readership, but there's a lot of people out there, if they saw this book, would re really be able to connect with it. There's so many ways to connect. And that leads to the next point, who will your readership be that would like it? Um, sometimes you see when people write to trends, writing to a trend is like something that's really popular. You can always confirm that, pop, you know, that people will want to read it. So we all remember the nightmare of Twilight. After Twilight, there was like a whole plethora of vampire books. Um, and then really what it d comes down to is the bottom line. Um, I can't really bring a book to a publisher if your book isn't commercially viable because I have to somehow indicate they will make money. That is what it comes... It, the, and the reality is we're all creative. We all love books. We love words. That's great. This is what unifies us. But if they're going to spend money on your book, I, they, I have to somehow convince them they will make a profit <laughs> and that you will make money too. So the big step is I think you should build your library. So this is the children's writers and illustrators market. So for anyone here in the room who's doing kid lit, uh, that's the one you want to get. It's going to be a little more detailed. Um, and then I'm a big fan of Jeff Herman. I know him in real life. He's kind of a character, um, but he, uh, he basically created this as an alternative to the Writer's Digest series. Of course, Writer's Market is what you call the Bible. It's like your doorstopper reference guide. It's got everything. Um, and then if you're like, you know what, I just don't, I don't need publisher information, I just need literary agents, then there's a literary agent's guide. So there's, any library should have that too. Um, uh, they, but you can even do like an online membership with Writer's Digest if you don't want the print version. Another thing too that I highly encourage is Publishers Marketplace. If you are a writer, I imagine you are writing, you're keeping your receipts and you got your Schedule C going and it's um, $25 a month. You can stop your membership anytime you want, um, but you could even just sign up when you need it. But one thing that's really nice is they have this thing called Publishers Lunch that comes out every day and they basically tell you what all the news, like if there's a new imprint or a new editor or if you know, they actually have a deals sheet and they'll say all the deals that are coming out. Or you can just go on there <laughs> and look yourself. There's a search engine on there by which you can narrow down by the category and whether it's children or adults. And you can actually see books that are sold by agents or publishers that are acquiring, acquiring those books. So if you're searching for an agent, you can actually narrow, once you figure out where your book belongs, you could just look at agents who are looking, you know, selling books like that through Publishers Marketplace. It's totally, it's really easy to use. Um, and then they have a thing called Amazon that's on the back end of this, this website. And it's not Nielsen book ratings by any means, but it gives you an idea of how books are selling on the Amazon.com marketplace. And it's called Amazon. So it's, it's another link that you can jump into. It's, and you can even have like an author page. Just, you know, if you have, if you, some people will self-publish and they market themselves and they go through here, but they're trying to sell rights, like maybe film or audio or whatever. So you can have rights offerings on there too. So it's a lot, of, it's very usable. It's a, it's a very boring page. It looks this boring, but it's very easy to use. Um, another one is, how many of you guys are on Twitter? Is anyone on Twitter in here? I have a non-Twitter crowd, oh my goodness. It's crazy. Oh my goodness. So you just need to write on your, your notes, Twitter, because you're going to have to get on. We'll get on there later. We'll spend some quality time. So this is, on Twitter, there's this thing um, called a hashtag or the pound sign. Um, and you can actually, you have to talk in 140 characters. So it's, it is, he's laughing. <laughs> so like you, it's, it's a really quick, it's like what I call um, a cocktail party kind of thing. You go in, you talk, and you talk with people, and then you step away. It's very quiet. But they have this thing called manuscript wish list. And several times a year, um, agents will get on there and editors, and they'll get on Twitter and they'll state things that they're looking for. And they use this hashtag the pound sign, MSWL, which MS is manuscript, and WL is wish list. And so if you go to the website, there's actually a website that merges all the things that we we're looking for into, if, you'll get to see it up with your notes, but it has romance, fantasy, sci-fi, mystery, thriller, contemporary, middle grade, young adult, new adult, and adult. So you can click on the link, and you can actually see all the agents and editors saying what they're looking for. So um, it's really, if you read through those, listings on the website, you might actually find someone who has requested exactly what your book is. QueryTracker.net is another engine you can use. 
Query Tracker is also a little bit bumpy sometimes. My suggestion too, it, it, use it for the research, but don't pay them to use the query letter service. Um, the reason being is that I know when you've sent it through QueryTracker.net because it's not personalized and it has like weird little signature at the bottom. Um, so if anything, your chance is just to figure out agents that are looking for like basically what we're looking for. And um, I've seen a lot of writers just discuss on the comments page, which is there's a comment section where they can actually, uh, they'll say, well, I you know, submitted a, a request to Jenny or Laura or Don or whoever at the agency and um, they requested 50 pages and they turned it down and this is what they said. So they, they had this commentary going all the time. Another thing, and this is back to Twitter, <laughs> Um, is there's this event where, you know, I told you how the, like, the agents get to claim what they want. There's a day where the writers get to share their ideas and we follow you um, on Twitter. So the roles are reversed and it's called pit mad as in pitch madness. Um, and that's basically, as a writer, you pitch your idea on Twitter and 140 characters. So remember that exercise, 50 words or less, describe your book, this is where you put it into, you know, you actually exercise it. If an agent or editor is participating on, in Pitch Madness, they'll get on Twitter and they'll say, I'm excited about Pitch Madness or whatever, if I star your, 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 twi your tweet that you just did, um, then please send me 50 pages. Like they, so they'll state clearly that they're participating. Um, and then so you'll get on there and you'll just pitch your idea. And then if, if an agent stars it, you'll get notified. And then you just go to their profile and see how to send them information. So this is a really easy way to pitch ideas. And it's, it, it kind of goes everywhere. And hashtags, which we'll talk about today, you'll use a hashtag. So you use that pound sign because basically they create a link. Everything that everyone says is linked together through that, that little link. So you would use young adult is YA, that's kind of a give. Middle grade is MG. Uh, a would be adult. Um, and then there's this category called new adult, which is for where the characters are, it's, it's like written almost like a young adult novel, but the characters are 18 to 24 usually. And that's in A. And then if you're doing a picture book, because a lot of people do picture books, P, B. And then nonfiction, that's my baby category. I love nonfiction, that's in F. So, um, and there's all kinds of other events, but even just like getting on there, you find, you'll build a nice network of writers from all over the world, which is great. Like I've, I've got to work with other agents um, who are in other countries just because it, of Twitter. Twitter's been great. Like I said, it's like a cocktail party. Um, there's other ways that we might find people though. Um, referral is sometimes happens. I don't really highly suggest that this happens very often, but when it happens and it's done right, it's fantastic. But if I have a good working relationship with one of my authors and they're like, you should meet blah, 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 because they know how I do my job, then I usually take that pretty seriously. So if you're friends with a writer and they've read your writing, that's where a referral comes handy. Sometimes we seek out ideas. So I mentioned the women in the circus book. I've even tried to get people to write it for me. <laughs> you know, like I've created an idea, but I still haven't found anyone to do it. Um, and then sometimes a publishing house will recommend that you find a specific agent. So for example, uh, Jenny at the agency, um, she does science fiction fantasy, and she's my number two at the agency. She um, goes to Worldcon, and she goes to all these science fiction conventions. And she became friends with Lee Harris. Well, Lee Harris was in charge of Angry Robot Books, and he's now tour. And um, he basically acquired a book, and the person didn't have an agent, so he liked Jenny so much, he was like, you need to go talk to Jenny. Like, Jenny Gullaboy will be a good agent for you. So we ended up getting this amazing author who is now on her third book. Um, so we've been working with her for a really long time, but that was through the editor recommending that we work with her. Um, and then conferences, like you guys came here today, this is a great stepping stone to attending like a large scale conference, but um, at large scale conferences, we take pitches in person. So um, that's where you come in and you pitch your idea. There's usually anywhere from five to 12, sometimes 20. I mean, the Writer's Digest Conference in New York, there are 40 to 50 agents at that event. It's crazy pants. It's a lot of fun, but it's crazy. Um, but we love to get those pitches. So 
a lot of people will come, uh, to come to more intimate classes and then get their idea ready to go, and then they go to the big conference, and you just kind of hit a lot of birds with one stone, and you share your idea with everybody. Things worth noting is a writing platform. We basically want to just get an idea that you put yourself outside your comfort zone. I'm very emphatic with my authors that in that I know that it's this isolated task and writing is very emotional and you tend to kind of put your, you have to kind of turn off the world to do what you do so well, which I am not a writer and I respect people who do that like yourselves. <laughs> it's very hard. But at some point, you have to get outside that comfort zone and, and, and really sell yourself and not end the idea. And so that means that when I'm looking at you, I'm looking not only at your idea, but you as a person. But also I'm looking at where have you, have you tried to get yourself published? Have, do you have a website? Are you, are you a member of any organization? So you're a member of this group. That's great. That's good. You mentioned that in your bio. Um, but also, like, if you're, if you're writing in a specific category, like maybe romance or science fiction or whatever, join a, an organization that supports that. So, like, Romance Writers of America is a really huge org for people who write romance. If you're doing young adult or kid lit, you're going to want to be in the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And there's a chapter in Minnesota. There's probably multiple chapters, but we got a big, large one in, in the Twin Cities. Um, and they do their conference every October. I wanted to tell you guys what a good query letter is. <laughs> when we do query letters, a lot of times, so you just kind of get the idea of when I'm reading them. Uh, for example, the day that I pulled was like 19 hours. I had meetings all day. I was trying to finalize two book contracts. I was trying to deal with just putting fires out and dealing with my authors. And then at the end of the day, like at 10.30 at night, I sat down and I started reading query letters. And my eyes were basically glazed over by that point. Uh, so a lot of agents, we're reading query letters when we're trying to get breaks between, like little you know, breaks in between things. We're sleep deprived and over caffeinated. It's a combination of things. So with, with query letters, my goal is that you actually give me something that will, you know, gives a good impression, but also doesn't like glaze my eyes over. Formatting. This is something often re ignored. Um, size 10 to 12 font is ideal. Um, I recently got a query letter. It was like a size 2 font, and I just hit delete. I did not even respond. Also, people will overformat the query letter. Uh, so I don't know where this urban myth came from, but someone was like, change different, the important words to different colors or underline them. And I'm like, why? Just, just use a normal black font. Like, if it wants to be off gray, that's cool. Just don't feel the need to use a lot of colors and underlining and, and bold. Um, and of course, uh, as we transition from like what we call query letters in the old days when I started where I got it all in the mail, uh, you don't have to put your address in the upper left hand or right hand corner of your email. Um, you can actually create a signature and put your address there, but I really don't need your address necessarily. Subject line. So uh, if the, like it has subject, you could say, like let's say I wrote a book about monkeys playing banjo. So it's a nonfiction book about monkeys playing banjo. So nonfiction, Monkeys on Banjo by Don Frederick, whatever it is. So the reason being is, once again, when my eyes are glazed over and I'm tired and I'm reading all these query letters, um, I actually will answer the queries that might inter interest me the most just based on that subject line faster. So. Um, and then um, avoid putting attachments on emails. Any reason, can anyone guess why I don't want an attachment? Anyone? Viruses. Viruses, yeah. So the, uh, once again, the sign of a newbie querier is they'll write their query letter in Word and then attach it to the email. And they'll say in the subject line, please read the attachment or please read my, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, I'm not going to read it. Um, so. If you've created a gorgeous query letter, save that on your hard drive, but cut and paste that into a new email for each agent that you query. When I look at queries, I do three, I have three piles, virtual piles as I call them. There's pile number one, which is I look at your query, I think it's amazing, and I'll say, sure, send something to me, and I'll specify what it is. Then there's the no pile, the no's, if you at least address me by my name and it's, you did everything right, I'll, I'll have a very specific response as to why or I'll do generic. And then there's the maybe. And the maybe pile is the one that I don't answer immediately because it's not a no, it's not a yes, 
but I see some potential in that query, and I'm going to let I'm going to sleep on it a little bit before I come back and look at it again. So sometimes those are you at least if you get to the maybe yes is a goal, but even maybe just by having a good query letter from formatting to how you engage me, I will. Yes, you know, yes and maybe is where you want to be. You don't want to be in the no pile, because I will show you examples of no's here, and you'll see why I had a no. So, and that goes to the next thing, personalize it. So since most agents take queries by email, um, for example, my, at, my email at the agency is don, D-A-W-N, at redsofaliterary.com. So it is obviously my name. Um, so sometimes they'll be like, dear D-O-N. I'm like, you just emailed me. Um, or they'll say, Mr. Frederick, or Dear Sir, or Dear Madam. Madam, uh, just at least, you can just say Don. You know, it, 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 some people will get more formal, and they'll say, Dear Mrs. Frederick, that's fine, whatever, that's, that's cool. Dear Agent, that immediately warrants no response, as far as I'm concerned. Dear Editor, dear, I've heard it all. And I'll be like, I'm not an editor, so you've already, we've already, that's not good. So if you have actually typed in our name, we assume that you know our name. This doesn't mean we're not going to you know, answer your query letter, but it helps at least if you address this correctly. Um, also mention um, previous uh, projects that you know, we've done that, you might, that makes you think we would be a good fit. So how I, you know, I mentioned Publishers Marketplace earlier. You can actually see what agents have sold. We don't put everything on there. But we do, because sometimes I do work for hire stuff, you know, where an editor asked me to find one of my writers to write something, so I don't necessarily post that as a deal. Um, but if you go to Publishers Marketplace, you can see what we sold. So if you, um, I'll give you an amazing example here in a minute, but when someone has actually done the homework and they've gone to our website and looked at what I'm looking for, and then they mention something I've sold, that means they did their homework. I'm much likely, I, that means we're, we're already, you know, You've, you've, you've done your research. Um, and, and that's when you mention why you chose the agency. Uh, so sometimes there's a, nothing is worse than reading a query letter and seeing the desperation in the person's tone. So I don't want you to feel like you're in that place. Uh, so if you mention why you chose the agent, like I met you at the loft writing conference, we spoke about my cat or whatever and my book or whatever. You get very personal. That can be a way of saying, you know, kind of making that, bridging that connection. Um, and then also I mentioned earlier being professional. Don't be creepy. I once had a guy send me a query letter where he created me as a character in the book. It, seemed, it probably seemed like a great idea, but it, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. And so you always want to open it up with a good opening. So this one says, Tom Tora, that's my author, my nerd brother and blogging pal told me he spoke to you about my manuscript and that it might be a story you would enjoy, which was true. So we did speak about it. I am submitting my 54,000 word contemporary, which in the subject line said middle grade. So contemporary middle grade is, it happened in today's time. Um, my seventh grade life in tights. He sold me on the title, so he's got the title, the word count, and he mentioned how he found me. Um, and then, this step up for the middle grade crowd has a very diverse cast and deals with LGBT issues. It is aimed at fans of Better, Than, Better Nathan Ever and How to Survive Middle School. So he mentioned competition, and also some of the themes or tropes to experience, like look for. And this is the best log line I've ever gotten in a query letter. All 12-year-old Dylan wants to be is a real dancer. It's perfect. It's funny. It's, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek because it's just a little bit outside the box. And so it goes on to say about him wanting to join the dance explosion team. <laughs> and he's part of the Dizzy Freaks. And they basically are like this all-boy dance team. It's the funniest book. I mean, I, it, it was hysterical. So he went on. This is a little bit more about the book. And then basically, I would have cut some of this down. Um, but then he gave me his bio. I am a produced screenwriter and member of the SCBWI, so we mentioned organization, and I teach at a public school in Tennessee. So then he mentioned my home state, where I'm from, but he also mentioned he was a teacher, so already I'm excited. And he has very embarrassing moments and memories of being on his own dancing team. It was New Kids on the Block inspired, called the New Kids. So he's offered that humorous moment as to why he's qualified to write this book. 
Um, so I ended up offering representation on this because it was hysterical. Um, eight other agents stepped in line behind me, and we all basically were battling for him. And my friend Yuva got him, um, and Yuva owes me beer forever because he knows how upset I'm about this. Um, the book sold in less than three months to Random House, and it just came out a few months ago, and he's gotten starred reviews from School Library Journal book list, Kirkus Review. It is such a good book. And so this one was like what I call star query letter because he talked about, he mentioned how he found me, word count, he knew his category. The tone of this letter was very much the tone of the book. Um, and he, he had, even though it was just a few sentences for a bio, I got the essence that he was the person to write that book. In Hollywood, when you pitch a film or a screenplay, you have to have a log line. So you have to kind of figure out what's going to work. So for example, our little e-publishing arm through the agency, it's a, we have a book coming out called So Where Buffy the Vampire Slayer Meets Alice in Wonderland. So you have, like, you have a little fun with that. You, you kind of give me an idea of what to expect with the story or the tone. Um, and my friend Jake, who teaches with me at the loft sometimes, he, um, he describes it as like, let's say you're in an elevator and Oprah gets on and you want you want Oprah to like your book. Everybody wants Oprah to like their book. Um, and you are going to be going from floor one to floor five. You have just a few floors to tell her about your book. That is your elevator pitch. And so that is, you have to be able to, if, what would you tell Oprah if this was your one time to meet her between three floors? So that is why we talk about openers. So this is the one that really I always love. It's kind of long, so I'll kind of give you, because there's two authors here. But the log line was, Choose your, choosing your own adventure is great when you're a kid, but in the adult world, the only options you usually have on offer are endless varieties of misery. <laughs> so this was your choose your own adventure, I want it so bad. And so in our book, Choose Your Own Misery, The Office Adventure, follows an every man office drone through a typical day, hungover, stuck at a job he hates, and wondering where exactly everything went wrong. And it goes on very comically to talk about everything that's wrong with his life. And it's really funny. Um, and so in Choose Your Own Misery, The Office Adventure, you have countless options, but they rarely end well. It's OK, though. A life of adventure would require so many uncomfortable sleeping situations. Besides, you have dental. Keep reminding yourself about the dental. <laughs> so I didn't even have to, like, I got to, like, around here, and I'm like, I, I, I requested the, the book in the full manuscript within five minutes. It was not that hard of a decision. And we sold the book in less than three months. Um, so basically, they gave me their bios. So Mike McDonald and Julie Gagnon have been writing comedy together. So I have two authors, so you can write with someone else. So the, basically, they gave me the hint of why they were amazing, because they have written for Vanity Fair, The HuffPo, The Onion, McSweeney's, all those big dogs. And then we thought you would be a good fit for this book when we learned you represent the zombie tarot deck, which I did. So they did their homework on what I've represented. And then sought out humor books. They know I wanted something. Um, there's a book called Yiddish with Dick and Jane that I liked. And they thought I, I would appreciate their tongue-in-cheek book because of that. Um, so they basically had a good opening. They have a good bio. They, had, they basically talked about my previous stuff. And they also offered to send me the full proposal and everything else as needed. So they closed it out really nicely. Um, this, was, this was a fast mover, and it's a really good query letter because I laughed the whole time I read it. Once again, half asleep, laughing. So it's, you know, you got, got a reaction. This leads to the next goal for you. Make your letter skimmable. So I was telling you about how we separate things. We're kind of, like, I'll read a query letter just like I read a manuscript. And I'll do what I call a quick glance over the page before I dive in to read it, just to see if there are certain things that stand out. Um, so by making it skimmable, I want to get an idea of what your book is about, who you are, why I should be interested. Um, so I keep saying this, but mention that genre and category. Um, you can't be everything, so just get, choose a side and stay with it. Um, one thing a lot of people will do is they'll say my book has crossover appeal. You can mention that, but you still have to at least mention the category. So crossover appeal is when um, your book would appeal to both teens and adults. So can you name one category that would appeal to both teens and adults? Is there one type of book? 
young adults, like, they say most, it's more, a lot of uh, adult women, me included, read young adults, even though we're definitely not teenagers anymore. Um, so, but they, the books had to be sold as young adult before we read them. Uh, so, uh, you have to think about what your real audience is. Of course, share the word count, which I've shown you several times, people have done. Um, one thing, too, is to choose your best idea. Uh, sometimes people will send me a bullet point list of every single, um, every single book they're working on, and that is fantastic. I assume that everyone in this room is working on more than one book. That is a natural part of being a writer. I just need one, just one idea. Um, and if it's something that I think is going to be good for me, and we decide to work together, I will ask about your other books. I discovered on Adventures in YA Publishing, this was some site that interviewed me, that you were looking for stories that aren't attempting to follow the current trend, so she quoted me. Um, it is because of this that I am submitting My Feet Are Beautiful, a 50,000 word young adult novel about a girl struggling with social anxiety disorder. So everything's great except that word count. But the social, that's too low. 50,000 is low word count for young adult. Um, but I, I like contemporary books for young adults and a book about a girl with social anxiety disorder. I felt like that's, that's a good start. Like I, so I kept going. So it, it talks about Chelsea Duvet and just basically due to her um, anxiety, the only thing she does is she looks at her feet all the time in public. She can't actually keep her chin up because she's just, she feels so bad about herself. Um, and about the, she just can't handle people very well. And so she starts a new school year and she is given this video camera and she has to make a video of a day in her life. This is a girl who hates being in front of people. Um, so that is how we start this book. And so we go on to talk about this and then her, her qualifications were amazing and she did not give me everything here, by the way. I teach at a small alternative high school, so that tells me immediately she knows teens. Additionally, she works with teens who are, are having some challenges, so that gives me some, some comfort. And she, um, she basically uh, talk, she realized that this book um, was needed for people like her kids. She has a lot of kids with social anxiety disorder, and there are kids today with that. So uh, she finished, I, I, she has her MFA. That's not necessary, but she happens to have an MFA in writing. And she got, her first book was published through Orca Publishing without an agent, and it, she got positive reviews from Kirkus and School Library Journal. So if anyone has ever been published in here, Kirkus is known for making people cry. They are probably the hardest one to break. Uh, they don't, they, they're, they'll even like give kind of a perfunctory like, oh, it was kind of good, even though it's really good. They just, they're very hard to, to win over. And School Library Journal is hard too. What she didn't mention here though is that she was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award at the time of this query letter. So it's like a Minnesota Book Award. And so she was a finalist, and she had to go to the event, and you know she she didn't win, but a lot of people were talking about how much they liked her book. So we sold her book really fast, and we the word count. I actually offered representation, but that word count was a flag. So I made her I made her like take it over six months and expand the story, go through an edit or two, so that we could get up to the uh, appropriate word count because we had to. There was no choice with that. Yeah? What would be the appropriate word count? 65,000 to 80,000 is average for a young adult. So for contemporary, you can hit 65K and be fine. This leads to the next goal, writing a good bio. When you're looking for a job, you, you kind of list why you're qualified in your bio and your resume. And this is what you do with your query letter. So you want to basically um, talk about those writing orgs you're a member of, any publication history, um, and TMI is too much information. And my theory is that once I work with you, I get to learn all that on my own. Instead, tell me about why I should be interested in you as a writer. What is the essence of you as a writer? Um, and then also make sure to mention your name. That's pretty good. Uh, so. We are in a day and age where people don't use their names for their emails. Sometimes if you send me a query letter and you haven't told me your name, I don't know how to write you back, especially with this day and age where people have emails where their email does not reflect their name. This was a, a book that I sold uh, last year and it's a pop culture history of World of Warcraft. And there may be some people in here who have heard of it, but it is a huge thing. You've probably heard of World, it's huge. 
he was telling me he had this great opening about World of Warcraft, because only like a million people play this game. Like it's ridiculous how many people, it's almost as popular as Dungeons and Dragons. Like it's huge and it's online. Um, so he talked about all these things, but then he gets to his bio. And so this is what got me particularly excited. This is his bio right here. But he said, my name is Tony Palumbi, so he said his name. Uh, Co-author of the recent popular science book, The Extreme Life of the Sea. So he told me about the book he had recently had come out. It's a really gorgeous book, by the way. I've served as a principal writer for two titles in the Electronic Arts best-selling and award-winning Sims franchise. So if anyone here has played Sims on the computer, he has written some of those games. So at that point, he's written, a, he's written about World of Warcraft, a gaming community, and he's created games that you install on your computer. So at this point, and he's published. So to me, he's looking pretty good here. And then he goes, my work on popular culture, video gaming, and science has been published by the Atlantic, National Geographic, Natural History, and the Los Angeles Times. And uh, then he goes on to talk about why he's qualified to do this book. He says um, he basically joined the World of Warcraft when it started, so he like, joined these guilds. And he joined a Spanish-speaking guild. He didn't speak Spanish, and he somehow became the leader of the world's largest Spanish-speaking guild, but he doesn't know Spanish. So at that point, I went, oh, this man is pretty awesome. So this book we sold, like as soon as I saw this, I requested the materials, and he proved that he could write. He's a good, good writer. We want to talk about the, the bones of your career life. I've given you a lot of examples, but so it's just like out there. There's your log line. So that's where you get me interested. This is where you put the carrot out, and I bite. OK, so get me interested with your log line. That could be one sentence, it can be three sentences, but keep it interesting. Just don't go too wordy. As you know, all the examples I gave you had really short openings. So that's why I'm gonna be interested. Then tell me what, what your book is about. Um, so for nonfiction or fiction, it should be one to two paragraphs, and it should be just two or three sentences in each one. Keep it short. Um, somehow people feel like they should give me everything away in the query letter, and you don't have to. Um, really, the goal is to tell me what the book is going to do, but like, let's say it's a mystery. You do not need to give the mystery away at the end of that query letter. Let the person who requested the book read the book on their own and, and solve the mystery on their own. Just keep it short. Um, we're going to talk about book proposals and how to be able to do this part of your, your query letter. Um, and then uh, paragraph three is why we should be interested in the book. So you would say, Due to the popularity of this and this, you can make, or you know, because of the popularity of vampires, or whatever the reason your book is, whatever is similar to it, I feel my book would, you know, be something you were interested in, or because you represented this book, or you did this. This is where you talk about it, and then that fourth paragraph should be your bio. I'd like to know a little bit about you. The last paragraph is really one sentence. It is. My, you know, the book proposal or the book is ready, the full manuscript is ready, and if you're interested, please let me know. You don't have to have us call, we won't call you. Sometimes people will say, call me at this number. No, we'll just drop you an email if we want to see more. So that is the literally five paragraphs, maybe six at most. Very short, short letter. Um, so before you approach the agents, did you write your query letter? That's goal number one. Um, and then you've gone through those guides I told you, told you about. So you went through maybe the Writer's Digest guide. You've chosen your agents, or maybe we went on Publishers Marketplace. Did you go to our website and make sure that we were still acquiring? Sometimes we close to submissions. Like some of them will close the submissions during the holidays, or when they have babies, or whatever. You just have to see what it is. Um, and make sure the categories match. Are the materials ready? So sometimes I'll request something and then I never see anything again. A few years ago, apparently, I requested a cookbook for cupcakes when they were like super popular. Person never sent it to me and somehow I forgot about it. Like I'm going to forget after a year. So it was uh, last summer, this huge box just like lands on my doorstep. There was no letter, it just kind of just showed up. And I had to dig through it and I finally figured out who wrote it and I emailed the lady and I'm like, why did you send me this? Like, what, and, and why did you print it out? Like, why? And she goes, oh, you requested it three years ago. I finished it. So it's, it definitely was like way past due. I mean, then also do a spell check, grammar check, all that fun stuff. Um, it's, it's, 
it's not going to kill your query or your pitch, but we do want you to at least have some correct spelling. Um, if I see a lot of errors, like I assume we're going to make errors. Every time I, I do a presentation, I'll see something I should have fixed. But that's all right. That's just part of life. But I, I don't intentionally not check it. So we always want to make sure that you do the, the corrections. Thank you.